the first time they laid eyes on each other, it was obvious that Jodi Arias and Travis Alexander had undeniable chemistry. Theirs was a passion so intense that it led to a steamy romance that resulted in one of the bloodiest and most horrifying murders of the 21st century. On June 9, 2008, the body of Travis Alexander was found lying lifelessly in a pool of blood. He had been stabbed a total of 27 times. His throat slashed from ear to ear and he had a gunshot wound to the head. What's even more shocking is that according to the medical examiner's testimony in court, the wounds on the victim were so disturbing. It was clear that whoever did this was acting out of rage. The medical examiner also mentioned that Alexander might have been dead by the time the bullet pierced his head, showing that this was beyond murder. It was a personal grudge. But to understand why Jodi Arias murdered her boyfriend in such a violent fashion, we have to go back to when they first met. You see, it was clear from the moment the two laid eyes on each other that they were from conflicting worlds. Arias was a prospective photographer looking to make a name for herself in the industry, while Alexander was a devout follower of the Mormon church. But strangely, these two managed to cross paths. Friends close to the pair say that when the two first met, Arias instantly fell head over heels for him. He was a man of adventure that loved to explore the unknown. And this really excited Arias, who was enchanted by Alexander's sense of humor. She loved how much fun the two had together. But little did she know that her obsession with Alexander would lead her to do the unthinkable. It all started in 2006, when Arias was searching for opportunities through a network marketing company known as Prepaid Legal Services Inc., where she met up with Travis Alexander in Las Vegas. She was attending a company convention, and that's when the two first met. For Arias, it was love at first sight. The two hit it off, and Alexander was polite enough to invite her to the company's formal executive dinner as his plus one. Yes, Alexander found her extremely friendly and beautiful with her long blonde hair. She was also in great shape and extremely sweet to him. During the dinner party, the two spent the entire time talking to each other. It was as if no one else existed in that room. They were inseparable, and nothing else in the world truly mattered. Chris Hughes, one of Alexander's closest friends, also recalls how completely blown away Alexander was with Arias. He recalls how after dinner, the two lovebirds spent the entire night talking to each other before going to bed at around 4 a.m. Alexander was so excited about the meeting the next morning, he went over to Hughes to tell him that he had, without a doubt, found his future wife and had big plans to marry her. Honestly, the two couldn't get enough of each other. At the time, Hughes recalls how cute it was to see them oogle and follow each other everywhere. But little did he know that Alexander was falling in love with the person that would shockingly end his life two years later. Once the convention ended, Alexander and Arias didn't want their new relationship to fizzle out. It would be tough for them since he had lived in Mesa, Arizona, and she was in Palm Desert, California. But Arias was so smitten by Alexander that despite living in different states, they managed to keep the fire of their new relationship burning by frequently meeting up to rekindle their love. They began seeing each other regularly and even toured some of the most popular tourist sites in the Southwest. Arias treasured all these moments and would frequently post photos of their time together on social media. As for Alexander, he wrote an email to Hughes describing how madly in love he was with her. I went from intrigued by her, to interested in her, to caring about her so deeply, to realizing how lucky I would be to have her as a part of my life forever. She is amazing. It's not hard to see that whoever scores Jody, whether it be me or someone else, is going to win the wife lotto. It seemed like the two were a match made in heaven. However, there was trouble brewing in paradise. You see, Alexander was a devout Mormon follower, and she was not. And behind the scenes, the two had broken one of the religion's most important tenets of faith. They had been physical before getting married. And because Alexander was a man who took his faith seriously, the guilt he felt about his steamy relationship with Arius gradually began to weigh him down. Before meeting Arius, he was always a very strong and charismatic fellow in the church. But once he found himself sinning behind closed doors, his conversations leaned more on the challenges of morality because of the girl that he was currently dating. Indeed, from an early stage, Alexander was always a conflicted soul. He even ran a blog by the name Travis Alexander Alexander's Being Better blog that spoke truthfully about his early life. In the blog, he would talk about how difficult it was having a childhood in Southern California with parents who had a drug problem. He would recall how tough it was living with his mother, who was too drugged out to cook anything for him and his siblings. 
Sometimes they only had a bowl of noodles or went to bed hungry. Fortunately for Alexander, his grandmother took them in, clothed them, and began feeding them. And that's one of the reasons why he became devoted to the Mormon church, because of the goodwill of his grandmother. It was Alexander's big plan to convert Arius to Mormonism, so he would frequently send missionaries to visit her home. He would also talk to her a lot about the Book of Mormon and also quote scriptures with her. Within a few months of their relationship, Arius had converted to the Mormon church, and Alexander went ahead and baptized her. But this wasn't enough for Alexander. According to Hughes' testimony, even though Alexander had converted Arius, he was still suffering from the guilt of being physical with her before marriage. Hughes mentioned that Alexander hated himself for the fact that he and Arius were still sinning away from the prying eyes. In fact, Travis wanted to marry a pure Mormon girl. And the fact that Arius had already been with him, she had automatically eliminated herself from the potential of being a wife. You see, marriage is one of the strongest, solid foundations of the Mormon faith. And so, it's very important for members to meet each other at the church and then marry inside the temple. Because according to the religion, this enables the couple to bond spiritually and eternally in the afterlife. However, as the relationship continued, Alexander's friends admitted that they began noticing red flags with Arius. They quickly caught wind of how toxic she was, and even tried to raise their concerns as the relationship became more volatile between the two. In fact, Hughes said that he had started seeing behaviors early on that were extremely disturbing. He even used to jokingly tell Travis that he was scared he would find himself chopped up in a freezer soon. And that came from the fact that from the get-go, Jody was extremely obsessed and controlling of Alexander. For example, one night Arius, Alexander, and two of his other friends were all sitting in a hot tub hanging out and chatting. But what was freaky the whole time was that Arius was climbing all over Travis while he was struggling to have a conversation. Hughes recalls Arius climbing him like a tree. He likened her obsession to an 8th grader whose parents were out of town and had just returned. Alexander was feeling very uncomfortable about the entire thing and just kept pushing her away and telling her to get off of him. What surprised Hughes the most was like, didn't she realize that his other friends were there? Why was she acting so possessive? That's when Alexander's friends noticed how weird and extremely clingy she was. She always loved to sit right next to him. She didn't like it when he talked to any other woman. And she would get mad if she discovered that there was someone who had no idea about their relationship. She wanted to make it clear to anyone who found out about them that he was hers and hers alone. As Alexander's friends got to know her better, they became increasingly creeped out by Arius's behavior. There were times when Arius would follow Alexander to the bathroom and stand outside the door just to eavesdrop on any conversation he was having. Like, you know you're with a psycho when you have to start taking phone calls in the bathroom. She would go through Alexander's cell phone on several occasions as well as his social media accounts and emails. Arius would be so overprotective that she would practically forward emails between Alexander and other women to herself. It got so terrifying that Hughes and his wife, Lavinger, decided to have a chat with Alexander about their concerns. So they sat him down and explained to him that they thought his life was in danger. However, because he was still madly in love with her at the time, Alexander downplayed their concerns, letting them know that Arius was really sweet and a good girl that he truly loved her. But Hughes wasn't convinced. He recalls having an instant cold feeling overwhelm him when talking about the situation. Suddenly, he had a strange feeling that she was standing outside his door. She's out there, you said. At first, Alexander didn't buy their story, but when they urged him to open the door, they were shocked to find Arya standing on the other side with a devilish face. Clearly, she had heard everything. At this point, Hughes and his wife were completely scared for their lives. They could see the fire in Arius's eyes, and at some point, Hughes thought she might even burn the house down with all of them in it. Finally, after five months together, Alexander gained the courage to break up with Arius. A few weeks later, she decides to move back to Mesa where she was living with her friends, completely baffled by the situation. But her obsession for Alexander didn't end. She would randomly show up to his house unannounced and enter through the garage door because she knew his code. There were times she would even go into the house by entering the doggy door. That's how obsessed she was. But Alexander's behavior wasn't helpful either. At times he would get completely angry and chase her away, and other times he would hook up with her. In a sense, he encountered her toxic behavior because he found it hard to let go. At the same time, Alexander met a woman named Lisa and began dating her. According to Hughes, Arius was so jealous of Lisa that she would try to scare Lisa by knocking on her door and windows before running away. And that's not all. 
Alexander had his tires slashed on more than two occasions while on a date with Lisa. While talking to Hughes, Alexander would admit that he believed Arias was behind it. When Alexander confronted her about the vandalism, she denied it. After living in Mesa for about eight months, Arias decided to go back to her family in Eureka, California. At the time, Hughes recalls how excited Alexander was. He was happy that he would soon be getting his life back. It was a whole new start for him, and he was extremely glad that he was escaping the toxicity. But despite this change, Arias and Alexander would frequently communicate via phone and text and continue to have a relationship. Yes, Alexander might have been happy that Arias was miles away from him, but there was no denying that she was still his kryptonite. Though the circumstances were unclear, text messages and Gchat history shows that in May 2008, the two had a very serious fight that left their relationship very bitter and sour. One of the text messages from Alexander said, you don't know what horror you have caused me. To which Arias responded, it wasn't really my intention to harm you. But Alexander was completely fed up and called her a sociopath and the lowest of the low. Perhaps this is what triggered a sense of rage within Arias that fueled her to do what she did next? In early June of 2008, Alexander was making plans to attend a company retreat in Cancun, Mexico with a Mormon woman known as Mimi, who he had been pursuing for quite a while. Hughes had already arrived in Cancun and was planning activities when Mimi and Alexander would arrive. Hughes remembers calling and texting Alexander, but he wasn't responding. After a number of calls, there was still silence. But when Alexander missed a conference call that he was supposed to be leading, that's when Hughes got really worried and left him a voicemail. By June 9th, five days later, no one had heard from Alexander. Mimi, who had not left for the trip, headed over to Alexander's house together with two others to see if he was home. One of their friends shared the garage code to the house, where they found his roommate, Zach Billings. They asked him whether he had heard from Alexander, and he responded that he was in Mexico, to which Mimi said that Alexander couldn't have gone to Mexico because she was supposed to go with him to Mexico tomorrow. Billings decided to open Alexander's door, and to their shock, they found a pool of blood on the carpet. As they walked down the hallway to the bathroom, they found Alexander's body crumpled up in the shower. That's when they swiftly called the police. The first officer to arrive at the scene was Detective Esteban Flores, who was taken aback by all the blood that was smeared everywhere. He immediately figured out that this was a major struggle and that it was personal. It was crystal clear that whoever did this knew him and wanted him dead. Flores also determined that Alexander had been dead for a couple of days. He had been stabbed 27 times, his throat cut from ear to ear, and ate a bullet to the head. Police further uncovered long brown hairs on the walls and floor, a bloody palm print outside of Alexander's bedroom, and a camera inside the washing machine. When Hughes got the news that Alexander had been murdered, he was speechless. How in the world did this happen to his best friend? It felt like a scene out of a horror movie. Ironically, within hours of Alexander's body being discovered, Arias called the police to inquire more about the case. When Flores got in touch with Arias to ask her where she was the night he was murdered, Arias told him that she had communicated briefly with Alexander the day he lost his life. She insisted that she was driving to Utah to meet up with a new guy she was seeing. During the conversations Flores had with Arias, he told her that her name had been mentioned several times by authorities during the investigation. In fact, Alexander's friends made sure that they talked about how toxic Arias was in his life. They mentioned how much of a stalker she was and how she was an ex-girlfriend who did didn't want to leave Alexander in peace. Arias denied being in Arizona at the time of Alexander's death. She was so confident about distancing herself from the murder that she even attended Alexander's memorial service and agreed to be fingerprinted by the police. That's when computer forensic investigators came across an amazing discovery. While analyzing the memory card of the camera that they found in the washing machine, they stumbled across photographs of her and Arias timestamped the exact day of the murder. The authorities also discovered that the blood from the palm print was that of Alexander and Arya together. That's all the evidence the authorities needed to place her at the crime scene. Then, they traveled to Yurka, California to arrest Arias. During the police interrogations, Arias tried to explain that the reason she had arrived a day late to Utah was to see a new love interest. According to her story, she was expected to arrive on June 4th, but decided to arrive a full day later. Then, she told the police that her phone had died and she had gotten lost on the road. According to Ryan Burns, the proposed new lover she was seeing in Utah. He mentioned that he had tried reaching her three or four times, but in each instance, the call had been directed to voicemail. So where else could she have been? 
The authorities later learned that a .25 caliber gun had gone missing from the family home of Arias' grandparents about a week before Alexander was murdered. Coincidentally, the caliber gun matched the caliber bullet casing of the one that was discovered on Alexander's bathroom floor. But was it a coincidence, really? While being questioned by Officer Flores, Arias was shown photographs of her and Alexander together a couple of hours before he lost his life. Why was she there with him? Despite being interrogated, she denied any involvement with the murder. And regardless of the amount of evidence that was thrown in her face, she kept on insisting during the interrogation that she wasn't even there. However, after spending a night in jail, Arias finally changed her story and admitted to authorities that she had been in Alexander's home the day that he died. According to Arias's modified version of the story, she claimed that she had arrived at Alexander's house around 3 a.m. and they spent some time together before going to sleep. She then claims that later on during the night when she was taking photographs of Alexander in the shower, two masked intruders, a man and a woman, broke into the house and were bent on killing Alexander. She also claimed that one of the masked intruders had commanded her to leave and if she didn't obey, they would kill her and her family. But authorities didn't buy her inconsistent story. She was later charged with first-degree murder and stayed in prison for more than four years awaiting her trial. Interestingly, while on trial, Arias told the court several conflicting stories that were nowhere near the previous two that she had told investigators. She admitted to taking Alexander's life, but insisted that she had done it out of self-defense. According to her new angle, she claimed that Alexander had turned angry and aggressive when she had dropped the camera, which authorities later found in the washing machine. She also made claims that Alexander had a collection of illegal photos that he kept for his own satisfaction. But upon further investigation, there was no no concrete evidence that Alexander had been physically imposing to her or anyone else in his life. Police found that none of the claims about his secret habits were true and that Arius was probably making it all up. During the trial, Alexander's brother Stephen was so disgusted by Arius's comments. He said that Arius was now murdering the memory of his brother by spewing lies to ruin his reputation. Thankfully, justice was finally served for the Alexander family in May 2013, when the jury found Arius guilty of first-degree murder. His family was extremely happy about the conviction as the judge sentenced her to life in prison without the possibility of parole. When interviewed about her sentencing, Arius admitted that she was surprised about the path her life would soon take. I was really hoping the jury would see things for what they are. I didn't expect to walk away. I knew that it was a possibility, a slim chance, in a parallel universe somewhere, but certainly not first degree. Currently, Arias is serving her time in Perryville Prison in Arizona, and even though Alexander's death took place more than a decade ago, Stephen Alexander still holds on to the loving memory of his brother. By now, he would have two kids, a beautiful wife, a home, and an absolute sense of happiness with a smile on his face all the time. But this opportunity was taken from him. This goes to show that no matter how good and caring you are, if you're with a toxic partner, it can completely derail and ruin your life. So with that being said, we've come to the end of this video. Don't forget to leave a like, click on that notification bell, and subscribe to the channel to get more bone-chilling content on some of the most shocking homicides in human history. And until we meet in our next video, remember, nobody owns a life, but anyone who can pick up a frying pan owns death.